three, two, one. Welcome to the Afterthought Sports Podcast. It's October 17th, 2008, and I'm Curtis Cardwell. Uh, we'll be talking about the upcoming NFL games today and uh, mainly focusing on the Thursday night game and then talking about a, a few other various things in the sports world. Uh, but let's get right into it here. So... First of all, the NBA is back, which is amazing. And two games last night, we had the Golden State Warriors returning champions uh, against Oklahoma City. Uh, Russell Westbrook, West, uh, Westbrook, he didn't play, but uh, OKC looked good. They they moved the ball around. We got to see Schroeder in the offense. Paul George just looked ridiculous. He was bombing from three. He looked smooth. He didn't every, – every shot he took looked money. Um, but it, it, none of it mattered. It was – Golden State Warriors, they looked the same. Looked the same. No, no cause for concern. No cause for worry. They, they're the team to beat still. and They just did their thing, basically. Durant was unstoppable. Uh, the other game was a little more interesting in – Enlightening, uh, I would say, the Celtics versus the 76ers, where the Celtics were dominant. They came out and looked amazing with their healthy crew. Got Kyrie, got Hay- <clears throat> Hayward back, uh, and they had a ton of weapons, and they stomped Philly. Philly didn't even look like they were in the same class. Um, and even I think Joel Embiid after the game said, "Man, you know, Celtics always beat us, but still, it looked it it, it was eye opening a bit. There's there's definitely a feeling that the Celtics now, even after one game, um, obviously there's 81 more games to go, but uh, it was a strong opening statement for for the Boston Celtics for sure. So interesting to see how the rest of that plays out." Uh, Next, Odell is in the news again because the owner of the Giants, Mara, basically said, you know, when you talk less and play more, but you can see why he says it. Uh, Odell, in this year, he has uh, one touchdown. One touchdown. And then, you know, everyone wants to talk about him being a top three receiver and blah, 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 blah. One touchdown. And it's not like he hasn't had chances. You know, week one, 15 targets. Week two, nine targets. Week three, 10 targets. Week four, 11 targets. And then after all the, you know, he starts running his mouth, and then he's getting 14 targets the next time, and another 10 the next time. And he's only getting, he only got a touchdown in the, in the time he got targeted uh, against Carolina when he was targeted 14 times. Uh and mind you, he only rec- he only caught eight of those of the fourteen targets for one thirty-one and the one touchdown. Uh, but for me, this is, it's over for him. He's never going to be an elite receiver again. And everyone likes to talk about his athletic ability and his prowess and all that. Uh, there's a lot of guys that have amazing skill. A lot of guys that have amazing skills. But that's not enough. That's not enough in any sport. And it, that's not enough in any area of life. You must have balance, my son. You hear me, Odell? You got to balance out. Too emotional. Almost seems like, you know, something else is going on underlying. So maybe something you haven't dealt with or something you need to tell your family and friends, you know? Seems like something else was bubbling under the surface. And I was never high on Od- Odell. Uh, you remember back in the day when they figured out you just had to play him tough at the line and, you know, play him physical at the line, and he would freak out. So, you know, you talk trash, you jam him hard at the line, and Odell's going to lose it. And when I saw it happen in the game for the first time, and all these multiple flags, and he caused that whole scene, it was, you know, he, he was exposed at that point. I think even, um, I don't remember, was it Josh Norman or something? started tweeting about it like we got you boy and they do uh and everyone basically and everyone has this season he didn't play last season the guy hasn't uh, he hasn't been productive in more than two years uh and 
I don't ever see him being productive again. What's going to happen? It's not going to happen on the Giants with Eli. Eli is the worst quarterback in the whole league. Uh, another thing I wanted to say about this, a lot of blames getting passed around and fingers pointed. I put all the blame on Odell. When you sign that big contract, you know the team you're signing it with. It's not like he was new to the Giants or didn't understand the organization or didn't understand who he was going to be play, paying, uh, playing with. He knew all of those things eyes open going into signing that contract. So if you're going to sign the 90 million, 90 million, you know, there was no illusions there of what he was getting into. And what did he think? Eli was going to be instantly better. They haven't said they're going to – they still – I think uh, the, the coach came out today and said, we believe in Eli, we're not going to start a different quarterback. Unbelievable. So yeah, the Giants have problems, yes, but you aligned yourself with the Giants. Not so smart of a decision if you want to like, if you want to showcase your talent. If you want to showcase your talent, you should have been doing your best to buddy up next to a quarterback. Um, you know, buddy up next to a, a nice quarterback instead of buddying up so close to Drake. I mean, you and Drake were living together, right? Weren't you guys living together? That's a little strange for two grown men to be living together. Uh, but hey, to each his own. So maybe you should spend more time trying to buddy up next to your quarterbacks and less time trying to buddy up to Drake and Little Wayne and some of these other guys. Uh, and you do have pretty, pretty hair, but I'll tell you straight up, Odell, you're a little bitch. You're a little bitch and I got your number. I'll step to you any day. And that right there, that's all you got to do to, to set Odell off. You got to get in his face. You got to talk a little trash. You got to jam him hard at the line. And he's not going to be able to handle it. He's shown that he can't handle it. Look at the little tantrum he did at the end of the game where he was attacking the, he was attacking the piece of equipment and, you know, screaming and crying. That's, that's standard Odell. So I don't know. <laughs> I think the amount of optimism in people that I thought he was done after, you know, they figured him out early and they were just, you know, put this guy like a man and he's not going to be able to handle it. But uh, everyone was still high on him for whatever reason after that. And since then, it's just been a steady downhill decline. So what's going to happen with Odell? He'll never be good on the Giants. They throw the ball to him 20 times. He can't get a touchdown. So, uh, you know, he's... Uh, maybe maybe the plan is just to act out as much until they're just forced to trade him, but I don't know who's going to want him. Who's going to want Odell? Uh, I, I can't even think of a landing spot. Maybe maybe Marvin Lewis uh, could wrangle him in or something. Who knows? Odell, I think, needs to deal with some of his personal issues like I was talking about. And You know, it's it's totally okay, Odell. We're, we're in a very free, open society these days. It's 2018 you don't need to be ashamed or you know about anything you can you can let us know and we'll still all love and respect you just the same as we do now uh, but yeah that's that's about all I have to say about Odell I, I don't think you'll ever see him return to top form and if he does I'd be very very surprised um, he doesn't have the personality or the mindset to work hard and do what it takes to be a top tier receiver in the NFL and he's proven it day by day so his stock for me, just continues to decline. Um, a few other, it's, it's, we're a ways into the season now, and there's a few guys still out there um, who need teams or are on teams that haven't shown up, like Le'Veon is not reporting to the Steelers camp. And this is very interesting because they franchised him, so he gets his money, and then uh, and I hope I'm getting this right, because this is just off, off the top of my head as I remember it. Uh, so they franchise him, so he's getting his money, where if he doesn't report all year, he actually becomes a true free agent. But because, because of the franchise tag, they would have to refranchise him, and in that case, he could just sit out the entirety of next year as well and, and get paid his entire franchise salary. Uh, because the rules aren't the same under that, uh, I believe. So it's an interesting situation for him and a running back that takes – you're basically getting into car accidents all day. Like, you know, it's the equivalent of 30, 40-mile-an-hour crash, uh, 
crash if you ran two cars into another. It's a beating at the running back position. Um, ask any running back. And that said, he's probably enjoying the time off to recoup. Um, I don't think there's any anyone in the position in the NFL that doesn't need some sort of surgery or some other sort of procedure at the end of every year. And who knows what nagging injuries or other things Le'Veon could have had going on. So I think he's just picking up – he's going to pick up that money and he's going to get well and hopefully become a, a real free agent at the end of the season, which is what he's wanted all along. Um, but right now, let's, let's talk about where Le'Veon could land if you were going to trade Le'Veon right now. Um, where I hope he doesn't land is the Patriots because they would be a powerhouse with him. He could be, uh, and it, you know, maybe maybe a spot like Baltimore could be a nice landing spot for him because he wants whatever his next contract is. He wants it to be long term. I think he wants to retire on whatever his next contract is, or or be darn close to it at the end of things. Um, potentially, you know. The Eagles, I think, could look look at him, but I don't think the Eagles, the way their contracts are structured right now, are going to have the money to sign him long term and sign all the rest of the guys that they need to sign long term in the next two year window. Because they got a, Eagles have a lot of big contracts coming up, so that's why I don't think that's a good landing spot for him. Um, potentially other places, maybe you know, Dolphins. I don't know if Le'Veon wanted to live in Miami. Um, they could use some help at running back, that's for sure. <clears throat> Tampa Bay, you know, needs a back. Who else? Maybe I don't really the Colts. I don't know. I don't know if they any of these places that Le'Veon wants to play. So it'll be interesting to see how this shakes out for him. But um, Either way, like, I'm kind of, interestingly enough, I'm, I'm on Le'Veon's side with this whole thing. I totally feel him when you're getting this much wear and tear on your body and it's a team you're, you've been bleeding and sweating for for years and now it comes time when you're in your prime and you're saying, hey, lock me up. I'm going to be a stealer till the end and they, they don't want to do it um, because you're on some previous contract that, quite frankly, he's outplayed every time, but... All that said, in the absence, Connor's, Connor's done just as well. So it is what it is. But I understand, I understand why Le'Veon's doing what he's doing. And I only think from an individual standpoint, it'll only be better for him. He'll be healthier, fresher, and ready to go for whoever he's playing for next year. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see him at all this year. Um, and another guy not playing that should be playing is Dez. What happened, Dez? You only wanted to play with the Cowboys? That's ridiculous. He must have he must have a huge house and be really rooted in in the Dallas community is kind of my thoughts on it where moving moving was out of the question for him, I think. And I think that was the main factor because there are loads of teams that could use Dez. Um and I can't believe he didn't like going to the Ravens. Dez and Crabtree, I love on the Ravens. I love that duo. Um, and even the Browns would have been nice. Uh, Dez and Landry, I like that. Uh, the Colts could use Dez. The 49ers could use Dez. The Bills could use Dez. The Jets could use Dez. The Broncos could use Dez. The Cardinals could use Dez. Uh, who else? <laughs> There's so many teams that could use a Dez. The Packers could use Dez. Um, how about Carolina? Carolina could use a Des Bryant as a two, as a Funchess and, and Des. That's nice. Um, what about Miami? Miami, I understand why Miami never has players. They never. Miami doesn't pay um, because you're in Miami. It's awesome down there. So you kind of get lured in by the amenities, we'll say, so. But Miami's another team that, you know, could use a Dez. Jacksonville could use a Dez. Um, you know, Chicago could use a Dez. Washington, 
there's there's a million landing spots on him. So my the only thing I can assume about it is that he didn't want, he didn't want to move. He was he's been in Dallas for so long his whole life, and that's where he's going to stay. So uh, enjoy it. And then the last guy, another guy that was you know previously in Texas, Cushing. And I don't know I don't know what the inside talk is on Cushing on why why if he's just too old, but I feel like Cushing can still play. And there are loads of defense. We don't need to go through the whole list again. But, you know, if if you're a fan of one of those teams with a terrible defense, imagine adding Brian Cushing to it and tell me it, your defense doesn't look better at that point. Um, he's still, you know, he's still serviceable as a linebacker. But, uh, like I said, I don't know if there's any inside talk about it or some sort of nagging injury I don't know about. Um but that said, the, it's interesting that those those three guys, such high calibers, and well, De, De, Des definitely waning in his his twilight years of the NFL. Um, but didn't didn't expect to see him retire so quickly. Um, new power rankings came out yesterday too. Everyone put out a bunch of new power rankings, so I did my own list, of course, and. Um, maybe we'll just go in chunks of chunks of five here. So my one, two, three, four, five are the Rams, the Chiefs, the Saints, the Patriots, and the Ravens. Uh, and that's Rams, Chiefs, Saints, Patriots, Ravens. So I do have the Patriots in the top five. The, I mean, they've earned it by their play in the last few games. They they look at. Um, the Saints aren't to be slept on either, you know. You have Kamara is – Kamara is one of the deadliest threats, you know, in the NFL next to, you know, I'm taking Tyreek Hill first with my fantasy draft, and then, you know, I'm taking Kamara second. Uh, you know, if I'm putting together a team of weapons, Kamara is just – that's why the Saints is three because Drew Brees, you know, he's a field general. We all know and love Drew. Uh, he's going to – and he has the leadership and the field generalship to, to lead a team to the Super Bowl, which he's already done, and win a Super Bowl. Um, and I expect the Saints to maybe try and add a little bit of defense in free agency and or maybe through a couple trades or something here um, and make a, make a run at it because they're poised. They're, they're definitely poised for a, a deep run. Uh, and then the Ravens, while not a huge fan of Flacco, they uh, the defense is just a force to be reckoned with right now. Um, so five through ten, I or uh, sorry, six through ten, uh, I have the Vikings, Chargers, Redskins, Eagles, Bears, and I think that's a fair six through ten. Uh, all those teams are going to put up, put up a fight against whoever you put them up against any given Sunday. Um, they have uh, serviceable defenses. They're not, they don't look completely exposed at all times, and uh, they have somewhat of balance going on on both sides of the ball. Um, 11 through 15, I have the Steelers, Falcons, Jags, Bengals, Dolphins. And here I have the Jags at 13 beneath Pittsburgh and Atlanta because, I mean, that's what they are this year. They're, you <laughs> Are the Jags going to win this week? You don't know. No one knows. The Jags don't even know if they're going to win. I mean, I mean, no one really knows, but the Jags really don't know. They, they have some stuff going on internally where I don't think there's a lot of discipline or structure going on in the team right now. So, Jacksonville surprisingly at 13 for me, uh, followed by Cincinnati and then Miami. Uh, 16 through 20, I have the Seahawks, the Cowboys, the Panthers, the Bucks, and the Packers, where the Bucks and the Packers have the superior offense of those five teams. But Seattle, Dallas, and Carolina, they're all kind of uh, similar teams ish. And, uh, you know, they, they can put up a fight, but. 
I don't know if they're in the same tier as those previous teams we mentioned earlier. Um, so 20 to 25, we have Detroit. As we're getting to the bottom here. So these, you know, past 20, we kind of get interchangeable almost from 20 to 32. So maybe we just read off this bottom section where we have the Lions, the Texans, the Giants, the Cardinals, the Broncos, the Jets, the Bills, the Browns, the Raiders, the Colts, the 49ers, and lastly, the Tennessee Titans. Um, Tennessee looks like there's no hope. That's the only reason I put them last is where San Francisco, I believe, can win games. Andrew Luck can win games. John Gruden can win a couple more games. Baker Mayfield, I think, will win a couple more games. And so will the Bills and the Jets. But I don't know if the Tennessee Titans will win any more games. So that's just a quick power ranking rundown, in my opinion, at least. Uh, but let's get into, let's talk about the upcoming Thursday night matchup, which is a really interesting matchup, I feel like. It's the Arizona Cardinals uh, versus the Denver Broncos. Well, it should be the Denver Broncos versus the Arizona Cardinals because Arizona's at home. And they're a home dog on uh, primetime television, which I like when that happens. It's uh, a lot of times that home dog wins on, on primetime. And the over-under is uh, 41 and a half. Uh, you can probably find it for 42 if you're really looking. So these teams match up very well. They're both, they're both in the middle, of the middle of the league in defense and both toward the bottom end on offense. So we have two not very good offenses going at two pretty good defenses. Um, so they're, uh, they're very evenly matched, and the, and the line shows it. You know, we have Arizona plus one at home. So uh, let's look over some, some of these uh, cardinal stats here. Okay, well, here's some just uh, betting trends, actually. That are happening. The, the total has gone over in five of Denver's last five games when playing, playing Arizona. Denver is 7-1 and one straight up in its last eight games when playing Arizona. The total has gone under in five of Arizona's last five games at home. The total has gone over in five of Arizona's last five games when playing in Denver. Uh, so these trends are kind of interesting to look at, but shouldn't be deciding factors when you're trying to make a bet. Where these are indicators, but it's not defin nothing's definitive with these kind of trends. You want multiple indicators to line up before you're making the decision. Um, so, you know, wh what do these stats kind of tell us? That the total has gone over in five of Denver's last five games when playing Arizona. Denver puts up points against Arizona. They're seven and one straight up. So Denver beats Arizona. The total has gone under in the last five of Arizona's last five games at home. So that means Arizona's not putting up points at home. Um, they're never going off at home. The total has gone over in five of Arizona's last five games when playing Denver, which means Denver's whooping that ass. So if you're looking at just those, you know, your brain will go to, okay, it's Denver 33-13. You know, that, that's what those numbers tell us. Uh, or maybe maybe less, actually. Maybe closer to the line where we're going to look at, like, 24-13 um, or something. Or 21-13, 21-20. So those are kind of some uh, interesting interesting stats with these with these matchups um let's look at kind of what arizona squad's been doing last week they played minnesota and they lost 17 to 27. um josh rosen had a a good man uh, you know a decent game for a rookie at quarterback 21 to 31 240 yards and a pick no touchdowns but he didn't you know he didn't melt down and he held it together um the guys he's throwing to are, are kirk 
Larry Fitz and uh, Seals Jones as tight end. That's that's his three main targets. Uh, he did tar- target Johnson out of the backfield uh, quite a few times, but only for two receptions. So he's he's hitting his main guys, and that, that's how that Arizona offense goes. You know, he's he's trying to hit his two big his two main receivers, and he's hitting his tight end and. Um, I'm surprised Johnson can't get it going a little bit more. I mean, he was everyone's number one fantasy pick just not too long ago, um, a couple seasons ago, you know. And now we have 18 carries for 55 yards and a touchdown, where maybe he's getting back into the groove of it, you know. It'd be fun to see a reemergence from Johnson and see him start picking up some of those running, running yards again, but so far that's not what we've seen. Uh, but he did get into the end zone last week, which is a good sign for the Cardinals. The, on the defensive side of the ball, Chandler Jones is everything for the Cardinals. He's, he's the man that's pushing the tempo and making plays on the defensive side of the ball for Arizona. And he'll be as big a factor as anything in this game where if he can get pressure, if he can get consistent pressure against Keenum, uh, it's going to be a long day for for Case Keenum, that's that's hundred um, percent. So that's what they did last week, and then the Broncos last week played the Rams, and they lost twenty three twenty at home, and they kept it close all game. And it was the first game where Vance Johnson, the the coach, had been under some criticism by the press, and so he decided to call this game, and. It was uh, he previously wasn't calling the defense, or at least he called the defense. I know that for sure. So I wonder now in this week's if he's going to continue to call the D because he did a good job. He contained the Rams about as well you could hope to contain him. Gurley went off, but you know what are you going to do? Uh, so you know you have Case Keenum throwing for 322 and two touchdowns and a pick, 25 of 41. Uh, a lot of missed throws there, a lot of incompletions. You know, if we look at who he's targeting, we got Lacoste targeted four times for one catch. Parker is the other tight end, one time for no catch. Huerman, the other tight end, six times for three catches. Uh, Lindsey, seven times for six catches. Patrick Lindsey's one to watch uh, tomorrow night where he's going to – he's one of my new faves. Uh Booker, the other running back, three targets, two catches. Uh, and then the three wide receivers, um, of the 41 attempts, he only threw two re- uh, three different receivers, Sutton, Sanders, and, and Demarius Thomas. And, and Sutton had four, four targets for three catches, Sanders 10 for seven, and Demarius Thomas four for three. And what, what that's telling us is Demarius Tar- Thomas is no longer – a number one target for Denver, and he shouldn't be. He drops so many balls, and he's he's proved to be inconsistent at best over the years. So, and, and that's what you're seeing. And he's still he's still a nice red zone threat though, because he's tall. He can jump, and when he wants to catch it, he can definitely catch it. Um, but Emmanuel Sanders targeted ten times. Uh, it's clear what's going on. That's who the, that's who they're trying to throw the ball to. Um, but that also could have been a result from uh, coverage sliding Demarius Thomas's way, and Emmanuel, Emmanuel Sanders uh, coming open because of that. But Emmanuel's uh, always been kind of a staple for the Broncos receiving wise. He's been he's been catching passes for them for a while now. So uh, the Broncos D it's been looking. Looking a little scattered, a little, a little all kind of all over the place. They look like they're not, they don't have a strong ideology right now, which is a, a little strange considering the head coach is a defensive-minded head coach. That should be, you know, when that team takes the field, the D should feel crisp. It should feel like the forefront of the team, and that should be what runs best on the team. And – Honestly, that's not what I see when I watch the Broncos defense. Uh, it doesn't look like that. It doesn't look like doesn't look like the Ravens. They're not shutting people down like Buffalo. They're not. Uh, they don't look like Dallas's D. Um, and it's just it, it's confusing as why. 
So it's either the players, you know, are they they haven't bought into Vance's system or there's lack of leadership somewhere in management or or some something's happening for that to be the result because Denver has a very nice defense assembled and there's no reason that they shouldn't be top 10 top 5 defense in the NFL. Um that's what they've that's what they've they've been and that's what they have the potential to be right now. A little commotion going on outside downtown Los Angeles here. Uh so the, they have the potential to be a very good defense and um I'm surprised to see that they haven't blossomed into one under Vance Johnson. So um just a few more trends about both of the teams too. Um, Arizona is one in five straight up in the last six games. Um, that's you know because they're one in five, but the total has gone under in seven of Arizona's last ten games. Uh, which you know, reading things like that sometimes a trap. You're like, oh, and it's gone under seven to ten. It's very good. It's a seventy percent statistic you're looking at. Uh, but what I, you know, what's totally possible is Denver scores thirty points, or you know, or or the opposite, or Arizona could go off, and you know, um, always happens. It, it happens often in those type of situations. Uh, it's it, it it can be a predicting trend, or it can also be a predictor that uh, it, it's due for the opposite to happen. So Arizona's four and one against the spread in the last five games at home. Um, so they're beating the spread at home. And that's what I was kind of alluding to uh, when I was saying I like, I like the home dog on primetime. I like the home dog on primetime, and Arizona's covering against the spread at home the last five games. Um, but they're two and four straight up in the last six games at home. And... Uh, I think we, as we said before, that it's been under in five of Arizona's last five home games, so they're not putting up points at home. That's for sure. Um, they do have some injuries too. Um, Mike Lupati, the guard, is questionable. Jamar Taylor is questionable, cornerback and secondary. Justin P- uh, Pugh is uh, questionable as well. So they're kind of the Cardinals are beat up on the O line, uh, which isn't great for Josh Rosen because Denver's D can get pass rush going on. Uh, and then also Trey Boston is questionable. Uh, a safety is sh- he's safety out with shoulder, uh, shoulder issue. He's also questionable for the game. Uh, but there's no one hurt hurt. They're all questionable, but those guys definitely are banged up. Um, and just Arizona at a glance, I mean, it's not looking good. Total offensive yards last. Rushing yards last, passing yards last, score four last, defensive yards 24, defensive rushing yards 31, defensive passing yards 12. So they are good against, they are showing the pass down, uh, which is the maybe the one saving grace of Arizona's team is that's what's allowing them to even hang in games is they're able to curb some of the passing. And I don't know what else to say about Arizona. You know, they're, they are not looking so hot right now. And I think they're looking for a high draft pick. Not that they're going to try and tank. You know, they're trying to get Josh Rosen as many looks as they can. But I don't know, I don't know how high I see them climbing past this 1-5 and five mark. You know, I could see him going one and five in the next six games too, and being you know six and twelve. I don't think that's, I don't think that's a stretch when we're talking about this team. Uh, but that said, Denver's not a great team either. Denver is one six and one against the spread in the last eight games. So uh, Denver loses against the spread. Denver's one and four straight up in its last five. So we got to remember the Broncos are two and four. They only have, they've only won one more game against the Cardinals. And who have the Broncos beat? They beat the Raiders. And 
I don't even remember who else, but I don't think it was a powerhouse. Uh, the total has gone under in four of Denver's last five games. Denver is 1-11 against the spread in the last 12 games on the road, and 1-11 straight up in the last 12 games on the road. So Denver has not been winning on the road. That's, what we, that's the takeaway from that. Denver has not won on the road, and it doesn't cover against the spread on the road. It's all bad for Denver on the road. Uh, and Denver has got way, way more injuries, guys on IR. There's a ton of guys out for Denver. Uh, who's questionable is Jared Veldeheer, um, the tackle. He's questionable with a knee. Pac-Man's questionable with a thigh injury. Um, Derek Wolf, the D-end, is upgraded to probable with his hammy injury. Um, Matt Lacoste, the tight end, is questionable. Shane Ray, linebacker, is questionable. Um, so th they do have a, they have quite a few guys banged up on defense, and a lot of them are questionable or probable. So, um, but it's, it's not major, major. Velda here would be good to get back for Denver because it's just more depth on the line. And they do have other guys on IR from the O-line. Uh, so depth of the O-line is always a good thing. Denver is 12th in total offense. Um, 10th in rushing yards. Uh, 16th in passing. Uh, 26th in average score of four, 27 defensive total yards, defensive rushing yards, 32. So uh, they're, Denver's terrible against the run, terrible against the run. And that's why a thought that I've been having is Johnson could – there's a possibility Johnson could get it going against Denver at home um, because – Denver hasn't been playing well on the road, period. And uh, it's not out of the question that Arizona can get the ball running at home. So the last five games for Denver, too, is they lost to the Rams, lost to the Jets, lost to KC, lost to Baltimore, and then they beat Oakland. Um, and the only time they covered was against the Rams. Every other time they, they, they lost against the spread. Um, and that's just Arizona on the, on the opposite side has lost, has only won one in its last five as well. They lost to Minnesota, beat San Francisco, lost to Seattle, Chicago, and the Rams. But they've covered three of those games they, they covered one was a push and only one was a loss. So if you'd have taken Arizona to cover in the last five games, you'd have lost one, pushed one, and won three. You'd be up. Um, and that's, that's the interesting thing about sports gambling is the money's to be made on the Cardinals. <laughs> uh So that's kind of uh, the overall, that's kind of the overall look at the betting trends between the two teams. Um, but I don't know if that really tells us much when we're trying to make a decision about who's going to really win this football game. Where um, it, it's really a game where I'm sure almost everyone could see it going either way. So it's going to be the little things that matter. And being at home, well, let's look at this over under 41 and a half. So 21, 20, and we're under. 61% um, of people are over, and 61% six, of the money's on the over right now, and 60% of the money's on, on Denver. So that's what, it, that's what it's shaping up to look like. Um, so it almost, you know, almost like Arizona and the under. Arizona on the under kind of seems like not so bad a call. You know, is, jo is Jones going to get the pass rush going against the Broncos? Probably. 
I mean, uh, we've seen the Broncos O-line struggle against almost every defense that they've played. It's, uh, Case Keenum has not had an easy time back there getting the ball out. He's, he's always under duress. And that's actually what the Broncos talked about liking about him is, you know, he can stand in there and take a hit. Uh, reminds you of old school Elway. Well, Case Keenum's not as big as Elway, and he can't continue to take a pounding like he does. But that said, I think Jones could get loose and get, get after Denver. Um, he could definitely get after Denver and uh, cause some disruption back there. And, and, and who, who's Denver? And, and Cardinals have been good against the pass. So who's Denver going to throw it to? they got Demarius and Emmanuel Sanders. And we've seen that that's, that's the only two people getting catches for them. Everything else is check downs out of the backfield or try to dump it off, a little dump off to the tight end. So it, the offense isn't great on Denver's side. The, the flashes of, of promise is Philip Lindsay, when he's touching the ball, he can take it. So uh, Denver's run game can, uh, can, can get going. Um, and, and when they do, that's when Denver plays best. That's when the defense gets going. Uh, is when Denver can run the ball and get a lead and then continue to run. That's when the Broncos are hard to beat. But... If Arizona can get the ball running against Denver's last in the NFL run defense um, and they're at home, I think it could be a very different game. And uh, an another, thing, another thing to think about is what do we think about Josh Rosen? On one side, the Broncos have tape on him now. So they, they, have, they have film on a couple games. And... Because of that, they're able to force him into more situations that he doesn't want to be in. And that's really what we see when teams finally get tape on a guy is they'll go watch the film and then figure out, okay, where, what makes this quarterback uh, the most flustered? What gives him the most problems? Where does he look like he struggled the most? And then they'll start devising defensive schemes that push those things to the fore forefront. Um, and Denver being defensive minded could have a very good scheme laid out for Josh Rosen. Uh, on the other side though, Josh Rosen has looked very calm composed. Uh, he's thrown some strikes. He's, he's taking care of the ball pretty well. And he's learned, he's still, he's still just a baby in this season. He's a rookie. He's a rookie. So he is growing as an NFL quarterback exponentially every single day. So every week he, he puts behind him, he's going to come out and now be a uh, – he's a better quarterback every single day. So this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking to f for, you know, how is Denver trying to scheme Rosen and how much has Rosen grown in this last week. Um, because there, there are a few weapons on the Cardinals, you know. Kirk can run and Fitz can catch. So they might ha not have both in the same guy. But that doesn't mean that they can't um, put together a little bit of offense, which they haven't th thus so far. But I'm planning on more offense coming from the Arizona Cardinals as Rosen matures and maybe Johnson picks it up a little bit more, if they can get their run game going a little bit more. So this is an interesting matchup. But um, at the end of the day, for me, I think I like that Arizona and the under, just because I like the home dog on prime time. And it lines up with all the different trends we looked at. And uh, quite, quite honestly, this game's a coin flip. Both these teams are not very good NFL teams right now. And it, it could go either way. So I'm going with the home, I'm going with the home team and defense. Uh, and I'm basically betting with Vegas there, um, which, which I don't mind because Vegas does well. So... Uh, that said, I think that's about it for today. Uh, if you made it this far, thank you so much for hanging out and listening, and hopefully I gave you some uh, insights into the game for tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, I think we're gonna, I'm going to start doing uh, all the picks. I'm, uh, all the picks for the, maybe the morning games, and then do potentially the, the, late, the later games on Friday. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out what's the best schedule and how to do this, uh, how to keep up, keep up with the, with the insane sports schedule, uh, 
I, I didn't realize how quickly this goes until you get in there and get after it. It's like, man, um, there's something new every hour in sports. Uh, but if it's your first time here, please subscribe and hit that bell and uh, comment if you can. And I appreciate all of it. And uh, hopefully you guys had a good time going through the info with me. And uh, I'll be dropping another one tomorrow and going over more picks. So uh, everybody have a great day.